Hello, Victor. Victor Glover. It's so nice to see you. I'm excited. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm great. It's, it's great to see you too, Lisa, and thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. Um, hopefully, people will be watching this today and in the future. So we have a lot to cover in 30 minutes because we invited people to submit their questions. Uh, and uh, I think most people probably don't have the pleasure of knowing an astronaut. <laughs> so we need to get to know you a little bit. Um, so, but first, tell us, um, tell us about your journey. How did you become an astronaut? Oh, wow. Uh, where do I begin? So it was 37 years in the making, I would, I would say. But, you know, I guess being an engineering student and starting with that fundamental um, educational piece, I decided to take my degree uh, to go into the military and, and do something a little different. I wanted to fly high performance jets or be a, a Navy SEAL. And that was really because of my experience playing sports in college. I really liked the technical side of of my education, but I wasn't ready to sit at a desk uh, for the rest of my life. Um, and so I, I was fortunate to come across the opportunity to, to join the Navy and I wound up settling on becoming a pilot. And I went to test pilot school, uh, saw an, a shuttle commander, actually one of the few female shuttle commanders we've ever had, Pam Melroy. She spoke at a conference and that really connected with my childhood. I saw a, a shuttle launch on television and I remember being fascinated by that and how so many people were gripped by that. And I just didn't really understand the details, but I just thought it was amazing. And so listening to her talk about their technical and operational accomplishments, but also her great respect for her crewmates, that mm -hmm. reminded me of my feelings for my teammates, my football and, and my wrestling teammates at Cal Poly. Go Mustangs. And, <laughs> and that really resonated with me. And so I decided to throw my hat in the ring. I applied in 2009, applied in 2013. And in 2013, I got a call, got to interview, I got another interview and then I got another phone call and, and that uh, changed my life, changed our family's lives. And so um, it was a long, a long process. It really is a long process, but I've been blessed and had such great friends and mentors and a supportive family that, you know, I, it was truly a, a team effort. Yeah, so many of us are behind you. I think you were in DC when you got that call. So I, I learned was. about it pretty early. I was excited for you. <laughs> Uh, so tell us about your mission to space. How long is it? Where are you going? What are you going to do when you get there? Yes, so this is a really interesting mission. It's unique. Um, if you're familiar, the, the SpaceX company developed the Dragon spaceship to fly cargo to the International Space Station. But the goal of that program was always to develop a crewed vehicle. Um, Elon Musk says he started that company to help NASA get to Mars. And putting humans in low Earth orbit is one of the important steps on going further. Uh, between the planets as well. And so they've developed this cargo variant, I'm sorry, this crew variant, this crew dragon, which is what we'll be flying. And so since the shuttle retired in 2011 with the, the final mission of the space shuttle, we have not had an American spacecraft to get our, our astronauts and our partner astronauts to the space station. And so Bob and Doug, uh, Bob Bankin and Doug Hurley were the, the test flight of this spacecraft and it launched uh, May 30th and they came home 60, 64 days later. And so the, the vehicle is, is certified or, or very soon will be certified. And at the end of this month, our crew will launch on the first fully operational mission. So a couple of things, what that means is the vehicle is certified for rotational use that we can send astronauts uh, to the space station on a regular basis. It also means that we have a full crew. Bob and Doug went as just the two of them, even though the vehicle can seat up to seven, NASA will only fly up to four because we also take uh, cargo with us. We take science experiments and other stowage, other cargo on the spaceship with us. So our crew is four people. We have a Japanese astronaut, Soichi Noguchi, uh, another mission specialist on our crew, Shannon Walker, and then my commander is uh, Air Force Colonel Mike Hopkins, and I'm the spacecraft pilot. And so we are going to fly- That's first cool, so you're yeah. the pilot for I'm, the, that's amazing. I'm the pilot, and so my first flight in, into space, and I get to pilot a, 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 a spacecraft that's, that's new to NASA. And I just think it's really amazing that this spacecraft is made in Southern California. And I was made in Southern California. And so, you know, being, being a West Coast kid, it's great to fly with this company that's rooted there in Hawthorne, California. And, and um, it, it's just a, a dream. So that's one very important piece, going up and coming home. Uh, and then while we're there on the space station, our spacecraft will stay docked with us for six months. And our mission will be somewhere between 180 and 210 days. So about six to seven months. And we will conduct 
science experiments, spacewalks. We will exercise and work together and do outreach and uh, events like this with the public. And um, we also- Oh really? So we get to talk to you from space? Uh, may, maybe, you have to apply for those and it's a little more, it's, it's really competitive, but it is possible, it is possible. We're and putting so, in our application right now. Okay, I'll, I'll let you know where to send it as well. And, and it's, um, it's, it's a mission to, to continue to prove that humans can live in space and to learn everything we can about the adaptations required to, to, to not just work, but we live there. When I go to space, I'm gonna live there. I'm gonna get to vote from space. That's awesome. Well, really how hope. do you do that? Uh, so uh, a few of the county uh, and state election programs have worked with NASA to make it so that we could vote um, essentially via email. We email our ballots to the county tech or the county uh, um, uh, voting offices. I forget the exact title, but yeah. we work with the specific counties. And so I'm registered here where I live in Galveston County. And I'm able to get my ballot emailed up to the space station. I fill it out and I email it directly to the county and they will count it. And so, you know, my, I've been in the Navy for 22 years and I've actually been an absentee voter all 22 years. So I've been registered to vote in California my entire career, uh, but this opportunity, I could have still used my absentee ballot from California since I'm still active duty military, but I decided to take advantage of this special arrangement that NASA has made with the uh, Galveston uh, County and, and decided to, to vote from space here in Texas. And so I'm really looking forward to that. As long as our launch date doesn't change, We'll launch on Halloween, October 31st. We'll dock to the station on November 1st. And so I'll get there just in time to fill out my ballot and send it back. Very exciting. How long is, how long is the flight? It, you know, the flight, um, well, just for comparison's sake, our Soyuz, the Russian spacecraft that, that we still send crews to the station on, they originally would take 34 orbits. Each orbit around the Earth takes about 90 minutes. And so that was like a two-day rendezvous we reduced that down to six orbit, I'm sorry, four orbits, so they would get there in six hours really fast. Uh, and actually, my colleague Kate uh, Rubens is going to launch here very soon. She's in Baikonur now at the Cosmodrome, their space, state, space center where they launched their Soyuz from. She's gonna launch and do a two orbit rendezvous. She'll be there in three hours. Uh, so it can be as short as three hours or as long as two days. And because this is a new spacecraft and for lots of other planning reasons, our, our rendezvous is gonna be somewhere on the order of 24 hours. So we'll launch and then about one day later, we will dock to the space station. So can you help me understand, why are you orbiting the earth? And are you going to the moon? Like, where is space? Like, help me understand, like, where are you okay. going? Yes, great questions. Okay, awesome. <laughs> I love talking about this stuff. Okay, so uh, first we're going to the International Space Station. That is our destination. Where? The International Space Station is 400 kilometers or 250 miles above the surface of the Earth. So if you drove there, you'd get there in about four to five hours. And so it's not really far away. So, so if this were the Earth, if my hands were the diameter of the Earth, the space station would actually be right here just on the back of my hand. That really thin atmosphere, you know, you really gain a perspective for just how fragile and thin it is because it's not very dense and it's, it's or, or very thick. And it, and it also is, it's, it's right around the top of that where the space station is. 400 kilometers, 250 miles up. You actually hit space. We at NASA record space as beginning at 100 kilometers. So if I fly and at least hit 100 kilometers, say we had to, to abort or do an emergency entry right after that. If I hit 100 kilometers and then come back down and land uh, in the Indian Ocean or, or the Pacific or the Atlantic, I still get my space wings. I get my astronaut pin uh, becomes gold once I go to space. So then you're no longer a rookie and you can, you've been to space. So 100 kilometers above the earth is considered space for us. Some agencies refer to that number as 80 kilometers, but we use 100. So we get to the space station and the reason you orbit is because it, it, imagine if you could throw a baseball at any speed, if you could calculate it, you know, dial up at any speed and throw a baseball. So say I get the best pitcher in the world and they throw their 100 plus mile an hour fastball and they throw it straight. It's going to land somewhere in the, uh, the stadium. No, I mean, no matter how good your arm is. Well, imagine we had like a superhuman pitcher that could throw a ball so hard. He could throw it from, say, California to New York. And that ball would fly. It would still be making an arc, though. It would go up. And as soon as it leaves their, the pitcher's hand, it would be falling back toward the earth. Well, imagine now we got an even better pitcher who could throw it from New York to, say, uh, Ghana. And that ball lands in Ghana. That ball went very far around the earth. But again, it was falling the entire time or feeling the effects of gravity the entire time. But it made it all the way across. 
Now, if that pitcher was powerful enough to throw the ball so hard that it would actually come all the way back around and land at his or her feet, okay? That speed is a very special speed. If I can get that pitcher to throw just slightly faster than that, fast enough to land back where they are, that ball is going to fall the, or feel the effects of gravity. But as it's falling, the curvature of the earth is also you know, bending away from the ball. So that ball will actually fall perpetually. Now the real world has drag and friction, so it would eventually orbit and deorbit, come back in. But what happens, uh, the reason it takes such a big rocket to get to space, we have to hit this special speed. It's about 7,500 kilometers per hour or 17,500 well, miles. How many is that in miles? Come on. 17,500 miles per hour. 17,500 miles per hour is, is the orbital speed. That's how fast the space station is going right now above the Earth. And so what that means is as it comes toward the Earth, the curvature of the Earth and the rate that it's falling roughly match. And that is what we call orbit. So it actually stays in orbit around the Earth. And this orbit is actually a specific plane that's between about 51 degrees. If the Earth were straight up and down, which it's not, it's at about a 50 degree angle. And it just keeps going in that, in that orbit. But the Earth rotates, right? Our Earth spins on its axis as well as spinning around the sun. So actually, the Earth spins and it rotates once about every 24 hours, right? That's what we call a day on Earth. So in that 24 hours, it's spinning. And so as the space station is orbiting, the Earth is turning underneath it. And because the Earth is turning, every time it passes back to the same spot in the orbit, the Earth has turned, I believe it's 22 degrees, about 22 degrees. So you orbit the Earth 19, uh, 16 times, 16 times a day. Every orbit takes about 90 minutes. And the Earth has rotated just a few degrees underneath you so you can see the entire Earth underneath you rotating as you're spinning around it as well. Pretty amazing. Wow. Pretty amazing. Oh, so you, wow, I've gotten you way into the weeds. I'm so sorry. I'm fascinated because I'm trying to understand like when you, when you get to space, like where are you? I mean, we only have movies for reference. And so you're a real astronaut, but I think we'll have to have follow-up questions about that so I can get to the meat of what people want to know. Absolutely. About what it's like to be in space. So you mentioned the research you're doing is about how the body responds. You're doing scientific experiments. Can you say, are, are you allowed to say anything about what kind of experiments you're doing specifically uh, related to health? Uh, absolutely. So in, in the, the experiments that we're doing actually have a wide range. I mean, there are psychological life sciences, physical sciences, things you would have done in high school labs, but because we can now isolate something very unique, it is a U.S. national lab and an international space station, an international collaborative lab where we actually can control gravity. We can put something in a centrifuge and, and make it experience gravity like on Earth, but we can also put it in a facility where it experiences the microgravity that we're experiencing. And so not many laboratories can do that, right? So um, we have an, a unique ability to look at even basic physics principles. So uh, we, life science specifically, uh, one of the main things we look at is bone density, muscle mass, and eye health. Those are big problems that humans uh, can develop or areas where humans can develop problems on long duration missions. So if we go to Mars, for example, those folks may be off the surface of the earth for one, three, five years, and only in partial gravity for a, 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 a small portion of that. So we want to make sure that their bones are healthy, that their muscles are healthy, and that they can see when they get there. Those are kind of critical to being able to survive in any environment. And so those are things that we have countermeasures for. We have certain, um, you know, we have certain medications to help with that. We also have a very rigorous exercise program. Everyone is given two different exercise periods every day. Uh, where they're uh, allowed to do the weightlifting, uh, cycling on the, on the bike, or a treadmill. And those are very important parts. So that's not as much of a research project. That's what we will call a countermeasure to, to maintain health, um, in addition to all the medical examinations. But we have ex experiments. One of my the favorite ones, or, or that ones I'm looking forward to the most, is a, an experiment that's just called food physiology. We're looking at using our food to improve health, your immune function, your overall emotional well-being, as well as your uh, gastrointestinal health, your micro, your you know the, the microbiome in your gut, and so uh, we're adding fruits and vegetables, specifically looking at um, uh, omega fatty acids, 
lycopenes, and I believe flavonoids. And so I, we have a basic diet that goes up, and then we can pick certain foods that we like uh, per our taste. But the food on the space station is a basic standard menu. There's a week or two of variation in that. And, and so this experiment essentially takes more of the stuff we already have and adds more fruits, vegetables, and nuts and seeds into my diet. So I get to eat more, and they're just going to uh, take surveys, qualitative and quantitative data on how I'm doing, as well as taking samples of saliva, uh, uh, urine, and feces, and looking at the difference in my, my gut health before I fly. So I've already started. They're going to take samples while I'm on board, and then they're going to look at my sam uh, those same samples when I get back. And, and try to, to, uh, to find some, some qualitative and quantitative uh, analysis from that. We also are you, have, taking, are you taking food there or they've already prepackaged the food and you're eating it there? We had quite a few questions. People are curious about the foods you're going to be eating. Well, we're NASA. We've planned for everything. There's food already there. The food on the space station has to last for years because we have to plan for crews to be there. We have to have food in case of an emergency if a cargo vehicle doesn't make it. So I have food that is already there. We just had a cargo ship arrive there uh, within the past few days. And that brought up some more of my food and clothing and science experiments uh, and some of my personal effects. And I will also bring food with me on my spacecraft. Most of that food will be for me to consume on the spaceship. We have enough food to be on the spaceship for two days in case our rendezvous takes longer. If for any reason we need to stay in orbit before docking with the space station, I have an extra day's worth of food on my crew dragon. Um, and so, yeah, we have food that's been there and it has, to, uh, it has to be able to last. And so we have food that is very similar to like the military MREs, the meals ready to eat. We've actually taken that same technology and improved it for, for reduced sodium and we've improved some tastes and, and, and shelf stability. And we have three basic types of food. Dehydrated food, which I would say most people are familiar with. You, you add water, cold or hot water. Our drinks are the same way. You add water, let it reconstitute, and you can eat that. We have a food warmer and a, and a freezer uh, that we can heat up or cool things down. But we also have irradiated food, where you take a small portion of food or big things and cut them up into small pieces, and then you bombard it with radiation and you seal it so that anything that is in there that's, that's organic dies and, and it's healthy and stable to, to, to live on a shelf. And then we have thermal stabilized, which if you remember uh, uh, back in like the, 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 the Cold War days or post-World War II when families would have their stock up, if they'd have powdered milk, or they'd have this stuff. You remember Parmalat? It was milk that could stay on the shelf. It was liquid and it could stay on the shelf forever. Parmalat is a thermal stabilized. It, you heat it up really high and then it kills everything and you seal it and, and it, it'll last for a very long time. So, so our foods are like that. In addition to the science of it, NASA has taken a lot of um, time to make sure that the food is also not just nutritious, but delicious. We have such great variety. And I'm flying with a Japanese astronaut, so the Japanese Space Agency also provides food, and we get some really great curry and rice. And, and, and so there's just, an, the, the Russians have food, and, and so we get to have these international meals. And once a week, I believe, they'll try to get together and, and eat together. And, and so it's gonna be something I'm really looking forward to. I specifically chose some European foods. They had duck and lamb, and uh, yes, please, so I asked for some European food as well. So we're going to have an international smorgasbord uh, on board the space station. Wow. <laughs> so I understand you had to learn some medical techniques or some things about health before going to the space station. So can you talk about that? What did you do and what did you learn about uh, the yes. body and about health? Well, um, I've learned uh, that the body is complicated and, and boy, the people who specialize in it like you that make sure that we are healthy as a society, I owe an even greater debt of gratitude. Uh, that's really the most important thing that I've learned is to appreciate public health and medical professionals. Um, I can't say enough for that. I'm going to do some experiments on board to try to improve medical technology and medical procedures while we're on board, kind of in my own time. Um, because, for example, taking a blood pressure in space or administering a saline solution, you know, a, an IV drip uh, is, is a little more challenging when you remove gravity. And, it, and it's harder to do things because I can't use both my hands all the time. So, so those techniques, we've, we are learning to advance those and make them specific for space. So my training, I'm actually what's called the crew medical officer. So every crew does not have a You're physician. You're a pilot and a medical officer. Wow. I'm a medical officer. So on board the space station. And so that's mental and physical health. Uh, so we all check on each other. 
And you know, we have psychiatrists and doctors on the ground, but I guess I'm one of the sets of eyes in orbit that's making sure everybody's doing well emotionally, that their workload's not too much. And then I have a commander and a US lead that can, hey, if we need to take a pause, we can slow the work pace down uh, because the pace is pretty aggressive. But I learned all the basics. I, I went to a dental uh, school and learned about the basic dental uh, 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 physiology, the, the basic anatomy, where the nerve bundles are. If I had to give a shot, uh, so that we could extract a tooth so I know how to find those nerve bundles and give an injection right there to, to make it numb. And then I can I know how to use the extraction tools and how to really, you know, we call it pulling the tooth, but you really push a tooth out. That's what I learned. I know how to extract a tooth. Uh, I went to uh, the emergency room and to a cadaver lab and to an anesthesiologist practice and learned about their specialties. And, and I got to uh, put in breathing tubes, remove breathing tubes, all the various kinds. I was able to, to um, you know, we have uh, one, one com not common, but one real risk of going to space, especially for the first time, like me, is the inability to use the bathroom. Again, every, I, you know, some of my veterans have said this to me before, easy things become hard and hard things become easy. Uh, going to the bathroom can be a challenge. And if it's too big of a challenge and you go too long, you may have to catheterize someone. And so I've learned to catheterize uh, and different types of catheters. We fly the Foley catheter on space station. And so I, and then I got to spend a week working in the emergency room downtown Houston. And I mean, just amazing. I got to wear a white coat and be in the emergency room and in the trauma surgery unit. And I mean, the, the patients, they told the patients that I was an astronaut in training, but other, they thought I was a doctor and they let me work. I, I sewed up heads, hands, arms. I gave injections. Uh, I put in a lot of IVs. Uh, took a lot of vitals and and uh, it was just an amazing experience and so you know it it was really amazing to to put in sutures that my first time giving someone stitches it was I've had stitches quite a bit myself and and my first time giving someone else stitches was just mind blowing and and I was like I'm really doing this my my goggles were fogging up and my hands were were sweating and my head was sweating but I was like do the work rely on the training. And I put them in and, and yeah. the doctor said I, I was pretty good at throwing knots. That's what they called it. I was pretty good at throwing knots. So, so you should come back from space and go to medical school and become a doctor. You're halfway there. So that's I, awesome. I thought about that. I actually, um, I think what I would enjoy more would be being a paramedic. I think being a paramedic yeah. is something I could see. Uh, you know, I also got to do a lot of imaging. I got to work with a lot of different imaging systems and I'm actually thinking about buying a uh, an uh, ultrasound probe that I can use with my iPad, the Butterfly IO, if you're familiar with that, just to have for my family travels. I gained a lot of respect for what you can do with good imaging devices. And so I, I may come back and do the EMT and paramedic training because that could be useful. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So someone wants to know how you decide if, if um, you, sort of, you lose track of time, I guess, in some ways. How do you decide when to sleep? Or how do you get on a schedule in space? Yeah, so I actually took a picture when we were getting started of our schedule. So this is what our schedule on the space station looks like. It is a, a running clock with real time and blocks of information on what activities you're doing, how you're doing them. This has your sleep time. It has your, your meals. It has your uh, workout time. And then it also has linked procedures. If you click on any of those boxes, it would open up a procedure if there is a procedure associated with it. So really the answer to that is when the ground says so. The ground writes this, they put a ton of work into making these. They review them seven days, three days out, one day out. They approve it and send it on board. And on, on board, we, we live by that schedule. That schedule is the list of things that you need to get done that day. And so before, after you wake up and before you go to bed, you have a couple of hours of time sort of to yourself to either get ready for the day or wind down before bedtime and you have kind of a 12 hours on, 12 hours off. Uh, and then within that 12 hours on, you have workout lunch and this pre and post sleep time that they don't mess with you. So it's yeah. a pretty reasonable schedule, but it is busy, very busy. Yeah. So what do you do if you get sick in space? Like if someone has diarrhea or gets an upset stomach, you were just mentioning it can be difficult uh, because there's no, I guess microgravity is the word, not no gravity, or you could explain that as well. But what if someone gets sick and has diarrhea or upset stomach? Well, you know, we have a very robust medical kit or medical kits on board the station with injectable topical medications, uh, uh, you know, 
things that you can take by mouth. But we also, most important, we have our crew surgeons on the ground that we can call at any time and, and they will get on the phone or on a video chat like this and they will help get us back to, uh, to safety. And then again, we have folks on board that are trained that if for some reason you need a, an injection of, of uh, anti-nausea medication, then you know, we can draw up the, the meds and, and, and inject them if needed. So we, we have a really robust ground team to help support us and to work us through that. But some of it is just things that you have to just work through it. You know, my first time going to space, I don't know what my body's going to do when we get there. And, and I may be the person who needs the help. And so uh, you just have to get through it. Yeah. So someone's asking, now, is it microgravity or no gravity? Because someone wants to know uh, if Black people's bodies have a different reaction to space than other people, particularly white people. Yeah. So that's a good question on both accounts. And uh, so first, microgravity. The reason we use the term microgravity is because at, at 250 miles above the surface of the Earth, gravity, the gravitational pull of a body, so of Earth, is, is, is proportional to the, the square of distance from the center of the body. So, Can you say that so, in English, please? Yeah, it, it essentially just means it's, it's, it's relative to how far you are from that body. And as you get farther, the effects of gravity go down. Well, we're actually relatively close to Earth, so we still feel the effects of gravity. But what you could imagine is it's like jumping off of a high dive at the pool. When you're, from the moment you leave the diving board, you get that feeling in your stomach like you're falling. So imagine now if you jumped in with your floaty around your waist. You and the floaty are both falling to the pool, right? That's what the space station is doing. The whole thing is essentially falling around the Earth still feeling the effects of gravity, but because the floor and the ceiling are both falling with me, it's what makes me float in the middle. So there are some effects of gravity, just not like we have here where I'm standing on the floor and if I jump up, it's gonna pull me back down. If I jump up on the space station, I'm gonna keep going until I hit something. So yeah. we, use the term, we use the term microgravity. Okay. So we and then, have okay. That, that, and then the part about um, you know one of the one of the interesting things it's I forget the exact numbers, but there's something less than 600 humans have ever gone into space, um, and with NASA on board the station, that number is closer to 200. So the N is very small, and in scientific studies, N can be a very important part of your data collection uh, and analysis and reporting. And so the numbers of African Americans that have been on the space station are low. And so the opportunity to have data that is robust and covers a set of, uh, a more meaningful set of, of, of genetic and experiential and pre existing conditions, life, health, and wellness conditions, uh, is one of the reasons we need to fly more people to space, not just professional astronauts, but, but humans. More humans need to go to space because we learn more. Yeah. I don't believe the, that microgravity will affect me differently because of the color of my skin, but the things that we know on Earth, if I were to ask your audience, they could name some things. You would probably say hypertension, heart disease, uh, and, and, and what else? Um, uh, high cholesterol. Those are things that probably affect our community greater than others. And those same genetic preconditions, those same genetic markers, that, that same background versus the nature versus nurture, that's true for the astronaut population as well. We try to stay very healthy. We try to pick very healthy people, but there is still that genetic variation and that variation due to lifestyle that it's very important that we get data uh, from, from yeah. a wide genetic set. And so I, I, I'm very happy that, you know, my genetics are going to be a part of our understanding of, of, of uh, microgravity's effect on humankind. Yeah, well, we have one minute left, so I have two more questions, so you have to answer quickly. Okay, sorry. Um, the first one is, is there coronavirus in space, or do you have to worry about that? I mean, we're in the midst of pandemic. Hopefully not. We, uh, you know, what the whole world is experiencing right now is sort of the, what the astronauts and our families go through prior to launch. We quarantine to, to make sure that everybody is, is healthy. And then once we get to space, it's a very clean environment, so we hope to not bring any, uh, any pathogens uh, or microbes up there that don't already exist up there. So hopefully no, and we'll stay that way. Yeah, and is there anything else, you have the last word, anything else you want people to know about your journey to space? You know, you can follow my journey. Uh, I'll be tweeting from space at Vic Glover. That might change once I get to space, but 
But, you know, I don't want to talk a whole lot more about the mission because we only have a few seconds left. I want to say, Lisa, thank you. I, I am grateful for your show and for your influence in the community, what you do. I have written you personally to ask about my, my family members, my daughters and my wife to, to, to help keep us healthy and safe. And so your efforts in the community are immeasurable and I am just so grateful to be able to call you a friend. So thank you and I'm glad I got to be on your show. Thank you for what you do. Thank you and we will be applying to talk to you from space. So I'm so proud of you, Vic. Thank and you. I hope the kids who are watching this will see they can become an astronaut or a doctor or a pilot both. or both or all three. You can. Yes. All right. <laughs> love you, Vic. And we'll, we'll be following along. Please do. I love you too, Lisa. Very good okay. seeing you.